All right. Uh, good evening, men. Um, man, if uh, I just want to say thank you for joining us. This is one of my favorite things we do. Uh, it's a unique time. We are uh, entering the, the summer holidays season. Uh, it is this year. We get to travel and everything. The world's opening back up. I know a lot of people are, are, are out doing that, but we have some guests visiting us today. And so uh, be sure to, uh, Pastor Shad, the, the uh, pastor of Northeast Baptist Church is here. Make sure you meet him and his team, his men, and uh, other men might be showing up as well. Uh, uh, his, these are the men he's discipling, and so he's, they, they're coming in to join us as we uh, unpack uh, what, what God has for us today. And so what we typically do is, is we, on Sunday I preach a sermon, and through it, we're going through Genesis right now, and then I usually take a portion of the sermon or uh, a theme from the sermon and try to apply it specifically to us men, and then we get into groups and we discuss that. And so today we're looking at hospitality. The theme is hospitality. On Sunday we saw that Abraham, uh, he hosted Jesus. He, he, Jesus came to us. House. He showed up, uh, the pre-incarnate Christ, uh, Jesus in the Old Testament, the, the, real, the real deal, the real Jesus shows up and he, he throws him a feast. And this Sunday, uh, we're going to see Lot throws some angels a feast. And so uh, this is a principle, a discipline of hospitality that we see emerge in the early parts of, the, uh, of Genesis. And then also we're going to see that we see commanded in, uh, in, in the New Testament, especially for uh, the, the pastors of the church. They are to be, um, one of the character qualifications is that uh, elders would be hospitable. And so uh, they practice hospitality. And so that the reason why that's a character qualification, because hospitality is not just something you do, but it's a heart that you have. And so tonight we're going to look at, at hospitality. And, and for me, uh, when I grew up, uh, my, my mom, uh, like she fed the entire neighborhood. I was in the house where all the kids were all the time. So I had a really good example. Uh, we never talked about this, discussed why. It was just every kid in the neighborhood was always at my house, always eating, uh, and they loved it. I don't know what my mom fed. I think it was just like mac and cheese. But it was just like, just, she was just there, and the kids were there, and they were always there, friends of friends of friends. And then when I played sports, my mom would be the one who brought like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to uh, every sporting event, and especially when we in track season when you're there all day. PB&Js all day from Mama J. That's how she got her name. That's her name. My kids call her that, but it originated from my high school friends calling my mother Mama J because she became like a mother to them. She was hospitable. My house was always open, and kids were always there. And, um, and so I grew up seeing hospitality but not having understanding it from a, a biblical perspective. Later on in life, uh, really God changed my heart, and, and I, because some will say, some who might know me have said, wow, Al, like, you, you love hospitality. It's, it wasn't always the case. It was, God, I, I saw it in the scriptures, my heart was changed, and I was like, no, this is awesome. I want to be a part of this. This is like Jesus, and so we're going to get into a lot of that tonight. But hospitality is indeed, in our day and age, a lost art. It's a lost art. It's a lost practice. Because um, hospitality, I mean, there were courses in seminary back in the day that, like, were about hospitality. Like, that is, and now we only think of hospitality as, like, going out to eat. Like, the hospitality business is, is people go, you going to some restaurant and they host you, um, which indeed they do. But um, biblical hospitality is happening around your dinner table, your house, with your family. Um, and in and, and pre-COVID, what we started seeing, so COVID has changed a lot of things, but pre-COVID, we started seeing that eating meals with families were, were on the decrease uh, nationwide. Uh, moreover, uh, inviting friends over to your house uh, was on the decline pre-COVID. Having actually uh, people, ho- hosting people, having, being hospitable was on the decline in our nation. And fast food sales were up. Like everything, fast food. Was, was just increasing and uh, was, was indicating that people just really didn't have time for one another. Uh, additionally, uh, the way we architecture our house these days, uh, it's not for hosting. It's actually for how can we get more people in, in, a, in a smaller geographic area and, and house more people in, in we, you know, in apartments, they may have like a, a swimming pool, but like no one goes to it. Like a few kids do, but that's not really the, the meeting place. It's not really where people are, are, are really meeting with one another. Um, additionally, uh, most of our houses don't have porches anymore. They're not designed that way where people would go out, especially around here or even in the south, would go out and be uh, on the porch talking to their neighbors. That's, that's typically not happening, at least how we're building homes these days. Um, and, and additionally, this TV has become the centerpiece of, our, of, our, of homes. Most homes are, what's the centerpiece? If you were to walk in, what would be the thing that everyone gathers around? It's the television, uh, where it used to be the dinner table. 
And I talked about it on Sunday. There, or it used to be uh, where you would, you would come, you'd feast, you'd have dinner, you'd host someone, but then you'd retire into maybe a reading room or a room in which you would drink tea or, or, or have, have whatever beverage you would like and, and just sit around and hang out and talk. Or people would go to the porch and maybe smoke a cigar or do, do things like that that were hospitable and that, that, that were um, growing individuals in their relationship with one another. It's a thing that's typically lost in our day. Moreover, the way we use social media is actually uh, designed to keep us to have the most effect. Like it, it's, it's conforming us and trying to, tra- to, trying to transform us or conform us into uh, having all of our relationships being virtual. Uh, someone told me recently that there's a real thing that you can buy virtual land that's not real. People pay real money to buy something that's not real. I don't get it. I don't believe it. I believe it. But I think that's insane. Like, you're going to pay real money to buy fake things. Like, this is the world we live in. And it's not so far-fetched because a lot of relationships are happening on social media. Moreover, it's happening in the, uh, the, the gaming world where relationships are built in, in foreign uh, spaces, and I mean, in digital spaces to fight fake wars and rescue fake women uh, because we're too cowardly to do that in real life. Like, that's why we do it. That's why we do it. We want, we want adrenaline. We want to rush, but we don't want to take the risk. So this is, this is the world we live in. And so I'm just making observations, not necessarily uh, attempting to critique at this moment. Um, but uh, God tells us in, in Romans 12 that we're to be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. Not, and not be transformed by the world, but be transformed from the world, transformed by the renewing of our, of our minds. So two things will either happen. We will either be conformed to, to Jesus' likeness or will be conformed to the ways of the world and i'm not saying that tv i'm not saying that technology i'm not saying that uh any of these things are um things that we shouldn't engage in or or, or christians should not participate in in media or anything like that what i'm saying is that the christians should engage in these spaces with the mind to know that it is designed to conform you to its pattern. All right, we see this with cancel culture. Like, if, if you don't conform to the ways of, of the, the, the people who, who get the shot callers, you don't conform, then what do you do? You get deplatformed, you get throttled, you get... Th- this is a real world that we live in that is seeking to, to conform us into a certain image. And, and whether that's by uh, people actually doing this on purpose or because it's ruled by the spirit of the age, Satan and demons... Uh, or what we like to call algorithms, like we're being told what to think, what to do, how to act, how to, how to be. And all of these things are not in, in line. It's not actually cultivating hospitality. It's actually t- moving us further and further and further away from the idea of biblical hospitality, where it's such a, actually a foreign thing. Biblical hospitality is, is, is let me define it, I'll put it this way. Originally, it was in, in Abraham's time, was a type of... Uh, Travelers would be traveling through, and so to, to host someone would mean you would take someone into your house, give them food, give them water, maybe feed their animals, maybe you would take care of them in, in such a way they, they would spend the night, and then when they're ready to get back on their journey, maybe they stay a day, maybe they stay two, they get back on their journey. You've, been, you've played host, and you allowed them to, you were, the, you, were, you were the bed and breakfast. That's what you were. You were the Airbnb before that was a thing. That was you in your home. And, and people uh, were, were, Christians were called in the New Testament to practice hospitality. Moreover, it was not just with people passing through, but then strangers of any sorts. You see this with Jesus welcoming in tax collectors and sinners, feasting, dining with them. Basically, if you want to think of what it means to practice hospitality, it means hanging out with people who are strangers or, or, as, or different than you. Uh, strangers as in like maybe they're non-Christians, maybe they're different than you, maybe you just don't know them. You're, you're practicing hosts. Not for, they're not your friends. Friend, hanging out with your friends, throwing a party with your friends, uh, for only your friends is what we call fellowship. That's the Christian. We, that's a good thing. We should do it. But Christian hospitality is maybe you, you're doing fellowship, but you're, it's an open invitation to bring non-Christians, to bring your friends who, who may not, uh, other people might not know, and you get to be host to them. And so uh, tonight what I want to look at is, is cultivating us to be and, and helping encourage us to be hospitable men. 
So if we're going to have, we have families, if we're going to, if we're going to lead out indiv- as individuals, but then also lead our families, we need to also understand uh, what, it me- what, what does hospitality mean, what are some principles behind it, but also where does it find its biblical roots? Because we're not trying to just be conformed, passively conformed to the world, but transformed, namely transformed through the Bible, through the Word of God. And one of the things that God has called us to be, trans- one of the, the things in the, the Bible teaches that we are to be transformed unto do is the spiritual discipline, or uh, the act of practicing hospitality. So Hebrews 13 says this, verse 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. This is that, he's saying everything I just said. Do not neglect to, uh, to show hospitality to strangers, for, by, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Like the, what, is, what, he, what he's saying here is exactly what happened with Abram. And, and Abraham and, and, and Jesus shows up with two angels. Abraham doesn't know that they're angels. He calls them men. He calls them men. And we're, we're not going to see until Genesis, or Genesis 19 that they were angels. So you have Jesus, whom he calls the Lord, Adonai, like Yahweh. That, that he, call, he knows who that guy is. But then he's, the other guys, he just sees that they're angels. Or they're just two men. And so he plays a host. He hosts these men. And he actually entertains angels unaware. He's unaware of it. Uh, and, and the, new, the New Testament author of, uh, who wrote the book of Hebrews is saying, like, hey, some people, like Christians, when you're, you're practicing hospitality, sometimes you're doing it and you might be even entertaining angels. So don't be discouraged. It's like you've ever, I, I, there's sometimes I, I swear that there's been angels that have showed up in our church, people you see, you meet, and you're like, walk out in the parking lot, they're gone. Like, I'm not even joking. Like, I've seen these things happen, um, and, and you're just, people, you're just like, man, I don't know what, why they were here but they seemed like they had a need and we just cared for them, but they never showed back up. Sometimes you can get disappointed. Sometimes you can get discouraged. Sometimes you, can, you could feel that, man, we didn't convert them or we didn't have a gospel conversation or we didn't get them to uh, fill out a connect card or whatever it is, but, but sometimes you might be, you just not knowing, entertaining angels unaware. And so furthermore, in, in Jesus says in Matthew 25, verse 35, he says, for when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me in. He continues to go on in Matthew 25 to say, actually, because the, the people will say, well, well, when did you do this, Jesus? We, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you do, when did we see you a stranger and do these things to you? And he says, whenever you do unto the, to the least of these, you actually do to me. So Jesus says in Matthew 25, and so what he's saying is, when, when I was a stranger, you welcomed me. While Abraham is, is really welcoming the pre-incarnate Christ uh, and two angels, we, when we are welcoming and we're showing hospitality, we're, we're caring for those in need, we're welcoming those into our home and being hospitable, what we are doing, uh, we, are, we, are at, we're, we ought to be doing it as if we're doing it unto Jesus. Because Jesus will say, on the day in his kingdom, man, whenever you, whenever you welcome that man, that woman into your house and you were hospitable to them, man, that was me. That was like you were doing it to me. Well done. Revelation 20, or 3, verse 20, it says that, Behold, I stand, Jesus, Jesus is again talking, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus at the end of time is, or, or is telling us at the end of time, or in, in the last book, that there's a day coming. And, and he says it, that Jesus, we all, often think about this, Jesus stands at the door and knocks, and we see this as simply a call to uh, salvation, which indeed it is. But the call to salvation is not just the call to, to come to Christ, and, and yes, we get our sins forgiven. Yes, we get eternal life, but we also get an invitation to the wedding feast of the Lamb. On the last day, when in Jesus' kingdom, we're going to be feasting. He's actually going to roll out the red carpet. He's actually going to make a, make a feast. We're actually going to have the best food, the best drink we've ever imagined. And we're going, to, we're going to feast with Jesus. We're going to dine with him. We actually have the privilege to do this each week when we take communion. We are feasting at the Lord's table. This idea of hospitality, these feasts in, in, in the table is as actually the centerpiece, what I believe is going to be the centerpiece of heaven. Jesus is, is the, the main event, but he's going, to be, he's going to be having some meals. He's going to be having some feasts. We see this in his earthly ministry. He came eating and drinking. We, we see this, I believe it's in the gospel. We see that he, he's coming. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. He was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He was hospitable eating and drinking with the sinners, the tax collectors. And then... 
for us for encouragement. So we see this. We see that, that, uh, that, that hey, you could be entertaining angels. You could also, uh, you need to be hospitable as if you're serving Jesus. Jesus himself is hospitable, and there's a feast waiting for us. But moreover, uh, we, we know that hosting is hard. And so First Peter 4 and 9, there's an encouragement. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So tonight I hope to, to I want to give us uh, 11 principles of hospitality that hopefully will, will, enc- will, will encourage us, but also will uh, help us to do it without grumbling. So you have them in your notes, but we'll walk through them. It'll be on the screen too. Hospitality, num- number one, hospitality reflects Jesus and his kingdom. We see this, we, we see this in, in, in Revelation, in, that there's a, that in Revelation 3, that there's a feast coming. We see this in Jesus' life and ministry, that he came eating and drinking, hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. But moreover, Jesus was not just, just uh, he, he's the epitome of, of hospi- hospitable. Like he welcomes strangers. We see in Romans that we are to uh, welcome one another as God in Christ has welcomed us. We're to welcome one another, not just into the church, but into your lives. This is a reflection of Jesus in his, in his kingdom. He came to, to, the Bible tells us, to seek and save the lost. He, so that means he, he saw to it to go after them. If, like, I don't understand Christians who are like, well, we're going to just invite Christians to come to our thing and not seek after them. There's no Christianity about seeking the lost. Just, there isn't. It doesn't exist. It, it literally does not exist. If you're a Christian and you don't seek the lost, then... This is, maybe I may encourage you towards uh, following Jesus and his commands and following him in his ways. Like, Christians seek the lost. It's, it's what Jesus did. It re- so seeking the lost, being hospitable, is a reflection of Jesus and his kingdom. But moreover, it's a reflection of, of his kingdom coming to earth in the, in the new kingdom that we will reign with him forever. In the new heavens, the new earth, and the, in the, as I said, said just a minute ago, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Moreover, in Jesus' prayer, uh, he, he, he's praying when he teaches us how to pray in Sermon on the Mount. He says, Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's think about it. In heaven, right? We, we just talked about it. That's going to be a feast. So if you're, if you're waiting to get to the new heavens, the new earth, the feast, then, then how do you, how do you make, what do you make of the prayer uh, of Jesus saying, hey, Lord, we want your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then when you look at Jesus' life and ministry, and he's seeking the lost, he's hanging out with the lost, he's having meals with the lost, he's, he's, he's in the houses of tax collectors, the sinners, he's around, the, the prostitutes are coming to him and being healed and being transformed, and people who have diseases are coming. Like, he's just making it socially awkward for everybody, right? If you're a disciple of Jesus, just, just every, everywhere he's going, he's around some different people. At some point, it's going to be awkward. Uh, sometime, you're going to have some meal where you're around someone you just didn't want to be around, which leads us to the next point. Being hospitable actually reveals our heart. Having meals with people who are different than us. Hosting folks that are maybe non-Christians or people we don't know or being around people who are just not like us reveals our heart. Hospitality puts our lives on full, our hearts on full display. Right? So some people aren't hospitable and that's re- 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 uh, revealing their heart, right? Like, I don't want to host and so it says something. It could say a lot of things. It could say that they're, they're insecure about their home, so they, 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 they want to impress the, the people they're inviting. It could, it could say something about their, their hatred for a certain person. It could just show that they don't, they, they're, this is news to them. Like, wow, tonight I've, you, you learned that I've, you haven't been hospitable, and you're like, sign me up. I want to do it. Maybe you haven't had a good example. But also, people live their lives. People live their lives. And I'll say this way. The people who live their lives with a lot of secret sin, they will never be hospitable because they don't want to be known. Like, this is, this is one way to, to chat. This is, I really do believe this. I believe people who are not hospitable uh, have the, have the, the people who resist hospitality with, with the most disdain or the most resistance, I believe have the biggest idols, actually probably the, the, the biggest secret sins. They don't want anyone in their house. They don't want anyone near them. Everyone I know who, has, who is, is, is not hospitable, or who doesn't allow people into their homes, I might know, and I do, the people I'm thinking about, I do know that they have these, these things that none of their friends know, none of their families know. Deep, dark sins that they've been holding on for years, maybe 20, 30, 40 years. They're afraid of being known. They're afraid of other people knowing them. 
And so there's this fear oftentimes of, of being open. There's a fear of being true and vulnerable. Like, flash, let's go back to the social media world that we just spoke of at the beginning. It's a world that allows us to be fake, but also people to think that's authentic. Like, that's the new thing. People talk about, oh, I want to be authentic, authentic, authentic. That's not. They don't. They want to be fake, fake authentic. It's not real. Like, no one, no one, authenticity is now being fake authentic. Like, fake hashtags, fake causes. You're not going to do anything. Everyone wants to look good on social media. If you don't po- post this hashtag, you don't do this thing, then you don't care for people. But you look at their lives, they don't do anything for anybody. Like, they're like the Pharisees who stand on the street corners and, 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 and pray out loud, and everyone sees them. Jesus says, that's your reward. But you're not changing anything. You're not saved. You're actually not like Jesus at all. You're, you're more like your father, the devil. And we live in a world that celebrates that, that actually says that's better, right? When someone is caught in something, right? Someone is caught, uh, whether it be a, a especially, especially a, um, a public figure, they're caught. What are they told to do if they're caught? In, a, in some secret sin or something, something where they get caught. What do they do? They come out publicly and they, their PR rep tells them what to say. And we all, we, we all eat it up. And like, look, they spoke out. They, they messed up, but they came forward and they shared with everybody the wrong that they did. Then they go back and live the same lives. No one cares. No one cares. Because it's not about, it's not about, we're not after heart change as a society. We're after external change. Social media change. What is the appearance? Not the heart. When, when God was choosing David to be one of his kings, he said, man, don't look at the outward. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Hospitality reveals to us our heart. Our idols are exposed. And I'll tell you what, our idols, like they leave no room for competition. They're really competitive. Idols are really competitive. They're really, they're really, really, really competitive. And they will compete for your affection. They will compete for your soul. They will compete for your heart. Hospitality exposes them. Once they're exposed, it's your job to smash them. You can, it can be exposed and you can cover it back up and keep worshiping it. Or it can be exposed and now you worship it publicly. Hospitality, additionally, in our heart exposes our prejudice for certain people. I don't want to have this person over because of their income. I don't want to have, well, they're from that part of town. Or I don't, you know, they just, uh, they're weird. I don't, want to, I don't want to invite them over. Or their kid is really loud, or they, they really annoy me, or she just talks too much. Or, or what, 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 what is the, when you, when you seek to host or welcome someone into your home, there's, there's things that go off in our hearts and our mind. Well, I don't want that, this person over that person. Well, that person I don't know, just they're going to bring up politics. Let's not have them over. We all have that person in our family that we hope that doesn't come to the family gathering, right? Like that person is the one Jesus would be sitting around dining at the table with. <laughs> well, everyone else is really excited to be around the, 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 the hero of the family. Jesus would be near to the broken heart. The, he would be near to the outcasts. He'd be near to the one that no one wanted at the party. We also, uh, we domesticate our sin. And, and it's there's the and we we we, well I guess there's domesticated sin is that we oh no 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 I uh, we care so much oh I have boundaries or my carpet I don't want people to get it dirty and all these things and so we won't host because oh, my kingdom here on earth is really important to me and I can't have the peasants come in. Three year olds not allowed because they may break things. And this is worth more to me than the, than the new heavens, the new earth, <laughs> the house that Jesus is preparing for me. When you, we hear the things that, that Jesus is in the new heavens, the new earth preparing, it's pretty awesome. The food looks good. The, the streets are gold. It's just really awesome. Next, and additionally, so in this is all, it leads us to the third point that hospitality is a spiritual war. It's, it's, it's spiritual warfare. It really is. Your heart, your idols, Satan and demons want you to keep worshiping the the idols of your heart. Jesus wants you to smash them. Jesus is hospitable. So I I believe that when Jesus is being hospitable, he's rolling with a a 12-man crew of of people from different political ideologies, different backgrounds, different social, different income, all these things, right, we've talked about in depth in the past. And so he's rolling with all these guys and showing up to the Pharisees. He eats with the Pharisees sometimes. I think it's often missed that he he does actually eat with the religious and, and political elite, so what if, you, what if these guys 
we're on the different side of the political spectrum. They're, they're eating with the, the enemy. Some of these guys want to overthrow Rome, and some of these guys are hanging out with tax collectors who are indeed ripping them off on, on behalf of Rome. Like, Jesus is bringing his 12-person crew to, to a bunch of different meals, a bunch of different feasts, doing a lot of hospitality. And at some point, probably every, one, at some point, probably every single one of them, it was socially awkward. And Jesus, as a teacher, he gets to lean into those. You see it. You see it from time to time. He'll lean into these situations, speak to the heart. Whether it be a Pharisee, whether it be Jesus, Jesus calling Peter Satan, he leans in when our, our pride is exposed and he speaks into it. Because Jesus sees that in these moments that there's this real warfare going on. He, he's, he, hospitality is an act of war against the idols of your heart, against Satan and demons who hate you, who hate your family, and actually hate the people you're trying to reach. So if Satan can keep you from practicing hospitality in a world, just think about this, Christians, like if, if Satan can keep you from practicing hospitality when no one else in the entire world is doing it, when it's becoming obsolete, when the only relationships people will have are, 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 are on social media or are digital or virtual, and that's the only lane that, that people are going to be able to communicate and have real relationships with, and they're going to try to do it at their gym, and they're going to try to do it at their job, and it's just not going to be the same because no one has the Holy Spirit but the Christians. And, 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 you, and you want to reach someone, you want to invite them into your home, just like Jesus, and you're trying to, to, to introduce them to the person and work of Jesus so that their lives can be transformed. Who do you think is going to oppose you? You think that's going to be easy? Satan and demons hate that. They love that no one wants to do that. They love that the algorithms tell you who's, who can be your friends. They love that no one practices hospitality. They would love for you to just door dash food to a friend instead of having them over for dinner. I'm not saying that's not a good idea. Do that for your friend. But if the, if, if the only reason why we do that is because we think this is generous and, and then we put these boundaries around our home and our lives that we're not allowed to let anyone in, I would just beg us to check our heart there. We have a heart of hospitality. Number four, hospitality is not one size fits all. And this is what we have to understand. There's not one way to be hospitable. There's not one way to practice hospitality. And anyone who thinks that this is the only way to do it, there's, then they're lying to you. Just know that. Jesus did a bunch of different ways. Every Christian is called to practice hospitality. So men, you're, you're to lead your family in this. Like your God is going to hold you accountable to, to lead your family in the, the practice of hospitality. But it doesn't have to be in the same way. We don't all have to be hospitable in the same way. I'll say this. Uh, hospitality is, is something that can be expressed through community and with one another. Like two of you, two or three of you in your groups, like y'all could throw a party and then y'all all invite your friends. So it's actually not just one person hosting, but three of you maybe together with your spouse going, hey, here's a good idea. Here's how we can do this. We could leverage our, our homes. We can ledger, le, leverage our resources. We can leverage these things so that we can create a place that's hospitable to host people that are not like us, people that are maybe far from God, people we want to introduce to Jesus, have meals with them. And so what you can also do in, in doing that is, is, is through community, through your groups, like practice. Uh, we, we practice hospitality also by sharing with one another, hey, how do you do it? What's it like? You're really good at it. You do it a lot. Like, can I come over and watch it? Can you give me a check? Some of you are checklist people. Can someone give me a checklist? What do I need to do? Real simple. Have food. Say, come over. Like, that's really the bottom line. Everything else is like, is, is, it's just getting better. It's just getting better. You have liquids, drinks. That's awesome. Whatever. Like, even better. But it starts with food. It starts with an invitation. And so we, we practice hospitality even when we share how to do that and share our resources or, 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 or throw a party so that people can watch on, look in, and, and, and learn from us. But number five, hospitality welcomes all peoples. doesn't mean that every event has to be an open invite to anyone and everyone. Uh, and, but there was a time where I hosted something. It was actually not an open invitation. And someone showed up with a friend. And <laughs> I was like, huh, hmm. who said you could invite that guy? Who said that you could invite him? And immediately my heart was, like the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And I was like, man, man, that's not, a, that's, not a, that's not a spirit of Christ. That's not a spirit of hospitality. That's, that's a spirit of, of the age. Well, no, this is my house. This is my rules, my people, my invite. This is 
This is my clique, my crew, my gang, my culture, my home. No one else is allowed in. Even my wedding, we had like 20 extra people show up, and apparently you're not supposed to do that, just show up to people's weddings like whenever you didn't say you were going to be there. But we loved it. I loved it. But it was not good for uh, the seats. We didn't have enough. That's why, that's why it is helpful if you do know who's coming over. But additionally, it's, it's, it's welcoming of all peoples. It's welcoming of them. It's, it's saying, hey, you may not be like me, but you can hang with me. This is like the high school kid at, the, at, at, the, at, at lunch, seeing the kids that are not, they're not the, the popular kid who's been transformed by Jesus, Lord willing, he's going to go find out the non-popular kids and dine with them. Hang out with the least of these, the people who are, who are not their normal crew. Intentionally engage in relationships with them. And, and I say intentionally, it must be intentional. You can't welcome where other people into your home or into your life without being intentional. Because you will default to only welcoming and inviting people into your life that are like you. That's your default. And there's nothing wrong with that. Every person, every culture, that's their default. The Holy Spirit changes us and, and gives us the power to operate outside of our default into Jesus' default. To pursue, seek, and save those who are outside of us. So it's intentionality. There's intentionality. Um, number six. Hospitality uh, not just welcomes people into your own, but it welcomes people into your life. And, and what I say by welcoming into your life, it's, it's when you welcome them into your home. And I, and I really want to encourage you this. When you're welcoming others into your home, I really don't want you to put on a show for them. You're not, you're not playing whatever. You're not playing. You're, 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 you are hosting, but you're not pr- playing prom where you're, 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 it's fake. This isn't Cinderella coming over and everything after midnight is going to just go away and it's going to be awful. Like, this is a real deal. You're inviting people into your real life. So I, what I mean by this is, for my family, um, what we do is if someone is over to our house and it's bedtime, time for the kids to go to bed, we continue in our nightly routines regardless of who's there. Every night we pray. And you will pray if you're ever at my house. You can ask anyone who's ever been over to my house when it's time to pray. You will pray because my kids will make you. <laughs> That's a routine. They're going to ask you, hey, well, and I've had people, and it's awkward for them. You're like, is it awkward? Absolutely. I've had people who refuse to pray. And, I'm, and, and, I don't, and we go, hey, honey, they don't want to pray right now. Uh, but my kids pray. They'll, if you're pregnant, if your wife's pregnant or struggling with infertility, just tell us. We'll, we'll have our kids pray. They love praying for kids, and they love praying for people who get pregnant. They love that. They love praying. Like, they come over, and, and they'll, they'll, like, they, we have a prayer journal. When they, they think of a prayer request for their friend, they'll come over and say, hey, we got to get out the prayer journal. we got to put the pr- new prayer request in it. And so people are coming over. They're entering into our lives, and if they're seeing us in our time, whether it's through uh, times of a Bible reading or a time of prayer, uh, they're, they're actually getting to watch it. And some, for the first time, it's awkward, but if you've come over multiple times, you start listening. You start learning. You actually start hearing, like, man, oh, how, how can I pray with my family? Well, here's a way. At the Johnson House, when you see us, what we do is we, we, we uh, thank God for something, and we ask him for something. That's it. All go around, and we do it. Sometimes it's loud. Sometimes it's crazy. Sometimes kids are not paying attention. Sometimes they are. And this, actually, when you invite people into your normal life, Christian, non-Christian, like, they see that it's authentic, and that's actually real. Non-Christians, you're like, well, your kid asks them to pray. They can't pray the Holy Spirit. They don't have, like, you, yes, your heart is hard, and you don't want to host because you're awkward, and it'll be awkward. You got to get over that. You got to get over it. Like, it, it doesn't matter. Like, non-Christians, if they know you're a Christian, and you act like one, they're not surprised. They're actually not weirded out by it. You're the one weirded out about it. Like, they're not. Oh, hmm. They actually believe what they're saying. They actually, it was awkward. I don't believe in it, but that was kind of cool. Like, they do this every night. They didn't, like, change things up because we're here. That's awesome. That's hospitality. Did Jesus, like, when he's hanging out with sinners and tax collectors, he goes, you know what? I'm not going to heal today. I'm not going to heal today. Non-Christians are around. I can't heal today. I can't do ministry today. Like, what if they find out I'm really Jesus? Like, that's the point. They, he wants them to. So he wants you to live your life in such a way people know that you're following him, that you are a Christian, that you are legit. Embrace the awkwardness. It also helps us disciple others to do the same. So if your your Christian is over in there hearing you pray, I mean, they're more likely to to pray more regularly throughout their day. They're more likely to ask questions. They're more likely to actually move towards uh, maybe implementing that in their own life. Number seven, hospitality is required for mission. 
Like it's not just, it, 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 no, one, like no one is hospitable anymore. It is required, though, by Jesus for the mission. Like he came to seek and save the lost. Like I've said, he, he was hanging around tax collectors and sinners. He was eating, having meals with people that were not like him. Guess who that was? Everybody. He was God. It's required for the mission. And actually, as we've talked about already, it is probably one of the most powerful ways in which we can actually engage in the mission because no one else is doing it. Number eight, hospitality fosters belonging and believing. What I mean by this is in a world that we live in that's, that's full of chronic loneliness, like our world is full of that. Depression is up in our day and age. Like people are just lonely. What this does is inviting people into your home is what you're doing is you're, you're inviting them in and saying, hey, we may disagree on political things. We may disagree actually on Jesus. We may disagree on a lot of things, but you're welcome into my home. Like, you can belong here. You can go to the refrigerator and, and drink uh, drinks out of my refrigerator, eat my food. You can be, you are like family to us. You can belong here, even if you don't believe. We actually see this with Jesus. All the 12 guys that he picked were not Christians yet. When he picked them, they were not. He, he rolled with them. He was with them. He was hospitable to them. They, they belonged with Jesus before they believed. And Judas betrays him, and he's a son of Satan. Like, that was part of his crew. They belonged with him before believing, but it also fosters believing. Some people are in the process of maybe they've been hurt by the church, or they've been hurt by Christians, or maybe they've been hurt. Maybe they've been abused in, in, in different ways, and they, they don't feel safe anywhere. They don't feel safe around people. They don't feel safe around at HEB. They don't feel safe anywhere. Christians have the opportunity to create, through hospitality, to create a safe space for someone to come and be in process. They can be in process. They don't have to actually believe. Like, hey, we're welcoming you in, and you can be in process. Rosaria Butterfield, uh, you can re- research her and look up her, her story, but like, that was her thing. She was a, 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 a non-Christian lesbian activist, and she did not love Jesus, did not walk with him, did not want anything to do with him. But there was a, a Christian family that invited her in at the table, and she would come over regularly, have dinner. She would ask questions. They would, they would dialogue through uh, correspondence, and over time, the Lord saved her. There was a place and a home through the hospitality of Christians that, that, create, that was safe for her to ask questions. She felt like she belonged. She could process through things. She could ask about her things that she doubted. And when we do that, we give an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to transform. The world we live in does not do this. It's agree with me or get away from me. Christians should be a place where you can Man, you don't have to agree with me, but you can be, we can be at the table together. We can dine together. And it'll come at cost, because people, your people will look, just like did Jesus say, you're, you're hanging out with those people? Like, don't you know their beliefs? They'll send you a link to that pastor's, uh, you know, like if you're a really conservative pastor and you have a very liberal pastor in, someone will send you a link from your congregation. Can you believe that he's having dinner with that guy from that theological camp? I go, oh, I saw that guy like your photo. What do you think that means? It means nothing. It means he's hospitable. Number nine, hospitality is good for our children. It's good for our children to watch. If you're a parent, it's good for your children to watch. I just started off our time reminding, or I was reminding myself of how I grew up. My mom was hospitable. My parents were hospitable. It had a lasting impact. It actually, I didn't really get it until I saw it through the scriptures, but then it, everything was unlocked in for me. It's good for children to watch it. It's also good for ch- children to, and to, to know that they, they're valued. So my kids, when you come over, man, you don't get, you're, you're not front and center in my life. The Lord Jesus is. If you're coming into my house, we're going to welcome you in, we're going to host you, we're going to love you, but you're not the center. I'm not there to worship you, and I'm not there to worship your idols. I will not worship your idols with you. We will worship Jesus in my house. I'm the leader, that's my job to do. We will worship Jesus. I'll invite you to do that, and I will invite my kids to do that. We will do that together. But also what I've seen got people do, especially Christian, Christian families, but they'll, they'll be so convinced that I got to reach these people. I got to, and they start worshiping the people they're hosting. And they say, and oh no, the, t- the kids are messing up the table. The kids have messed up the floor. The kids are doing, the kids have now become a burden to their idol of, of getting approval from these people they're, they're trying to come in. To tr- they're trying to host. Don't, don't do that. My kids are a blessing and I want my, those who come in to see that. Well, they're crazy. Yeah, they are. But we're not going to put them in a room, give them 
TV and go, hey, it's time for the adult. Like, hospitality is just an adult thing. No, it's a family thing. It's a family thing. Man, there may be times where they go to the other room, they, they play, we have some specific conversation. But what we don't do is, 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 say, create an environment where people are coming over and the kids can't be a part of it. We want them to be a part of it. One, so they can watch it. Two, that, so they can know that they're valued. And three, that those who are watching, especially non-Christians, know that we believe that children are a blessing. In a world that does not believe that, we want to model that. And they expect us to. That's what, that's what the, being a Christian, your non-Christian friends expect you to be authentically Christian. So when you do things that, that are radical, like what the Bible says, and it's awkward, and it's different than them, they expect that. What they don't want to see is you adopting and being conformed by the world. They don't, they won't trust your Christianity. Like, there's never been a movement, and this is true when you look at liberal cities and you look at areas that, that what they start doing is adopting the way of the culture, watering, changing Christianity to adopt the, the, the progressive like, left movement. What you start seeing is actually not revival. Church decreases. So, no, you're just like us. Well, different. You put Jesus on everything, I put boot on things, it doesn't matter. Same thing. There's not a deeper community. There's not transformed lives. There's not transformed cities. It's actually in, in, in the areas where there's Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christians that, that are kind of socially awkward because they really believe that it's true. Heaven's real. Hell's real. Sin's real. We must repent. Our God got out of the grave. Like, those are weird things. It's those, when, when people look at the lives of Christians who are actually believed and actually live that out, that's compelling because no one is living out what they claim to be true. They're not. Social media is fake, and their lives are fake. And it'll cost you. It's costly. It'll cost you money. Number 10, it'll cost you money. It'll cost you time. It'll cost you relationships. So sometimes people will come over. It's not always great. They come over, they're like, oh, no, no, you really are this. And you're a, you're a little bigoted guy, Al. Like, you believe that there's only one way to, to heaven. Yes, I do. I do. His name's Jesus. Oh, well, I don't really like the way your kids are yelling. I don't really like the, I don't really like the whole prayer thing. You made us pray. That was awkward. I don't want to be here. Like, it, that might be true. It might come with a cost. It might come with a sacrifice financially. It might come with a, a sacrifice with your time. It might come, it might, it will, it will, it will, it will come with flexibility. It will cost you something. But number 11, hospitality is worth it because Jesus is worth it. It's worth it. Jesus says, whenever you do unto the least of these, you do to me. Every person you host, everyone who's in your house, every person you pray for, every person who you feed, every person who you give a drink to, every person you care for, every person that you invite into your life, every person, when you do unto the least of those, whether they have a lot of money or no money, whether they're in your social group or not, your political party or not, part of your theological group or not, whenever you do the, unto the least of these, you do to Jesus. And he is worth worshiping. So I want us to see that. At the end of the day, hospitality is about worship. It's worshiping Jesus with our lives, with our stuff, with our homes, with our, with our attitudes, with our heart, with everything. It's about worshiping him. Worshiping him with your home. You don't own your home. You're like, some of you are like, yeah, no, I rent. No, you don't even, that owner doesn't own their home. Everything's owned by Jesus. If you own something or you have something or you're a steward, or you have possession of something that's been given to you by the Lord Jesus to steward, to worship him with. And then number two, Jesus is worth, is worth worshiping. Therefore, we should aggressively, I mean this, aggressively pursue others. I say this because the world is aggressively pursuing them. The world is unashamedly, aggressively pursuing others. And we live in a world right now where Christians have sat on their hands and, and thrown up their hands and just complain. Like, I don't want to, I just don't want to sound like I'm, too aggressive, or I don't want to offend someone. Does the world, just, just, does, is the, does the world care about offending you? No, they don't want to care. No one cares about offending anyone right now. They don't. Do people care about offending Christians? No. Christians are mocked often and frequently, so much so that we don't even want to sometimes associate with it. Like, no one is, is ashamed to aggressively mock or, or pursue, mock Christianity, but, but more of them, they're not ashamed to aggressively pursue you to get them onto your crew, their crew. 
whether, and, 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 and again, going back to the social media world, the way that things are set up are, are for to aggressively pursue you to conform you to whatever it is. No business is not aggressively pursuing you. They actually are. So why in the world would Christians be so passive? We cannot be passive in our pursuit of others and expect the world to change. We must be actually more aggressive in our pursuit of others if we want the world to change. You're like, well, some people won't like that. Some people hate us. Some people will, will, will just will, will lose something. It'll cost something. You're right, it will. But it's worth it because Jesus is worth it. So we're entering into a time of discussion. We're going to talk about maybe some, some hospitality that you've received, talk about what maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. But our goal in our, in our conversations in our group is to encourage one another, to build one another up, to walk out and live out this. And your table leaders will, will, will help you with that. This will be our last meeting. Uh, for the, we'll take a seven-week break. Uh, we, we're working on what's gonna look, what it's going to look ne- like next when we come back. But for the next seven weeks, your table leader is going to keep up with you. Your table leader is going to follow up with you. Your table leader is going to hopefully help you cultivate hospitality um, and walk out what Jesus is speaking to you tonight. So let me pray for you, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll break up. Alex, will have an announcement, then we'll break up into groups. Lord Jesus, we love you when they ask that your spirit would move in power tonight among these men in the, their conversations. I ask that it would be a time of, of building one another up, not beating one another down, not talking bad about others, but, but rather seeing, good, seeing you, Jesus, in what you are doing and what you are pursuing and what you're calling us to, seeing that clearly and being willingly uh, uh, available and, and wanting to pursue that and that these men would help one another uh, to walk that out in their everyday lives. So bless them now in Jesus' name. Amen.